Dr. Mark Changizi here with your Science Moment. Today I'm going to talk about early language and kids. And, uh, you know, if you've had kids, you've or you've had nieces or nephews, you've seen their drawings when they're four or five years old, for example, and they're great. You know, the children's drawings are great. And I want to talk about the extent to which they already show that they are writing with their drawings. So their drawings aren't drawings in the in the pictorial sense. They really are early attempts at writing. And I'm going to read to you an excerpt from uh, my earlier book, uh, Vision Revolution, uh, bestseller Vision Revolution, which is about a variety of discoveries of mine in uh, the vision area, vision areas. And I want to just read read one excerpt from the chapter on the origins of writing and, and how writing culturally evolved over time to look like nature. This is how we harness our brains that never evolved to read. How we harness, how cultural evolution harnessed those non-reading brains and tricked them into becoming a reading machine, namely by having reading look like the objects in, in the natural world. But I want to just talk about uh, how your kids, little kids' drawings, are an attempt at writing, and I'm just going to read this excerpt um, from the chapter called Spirit Reading, and this is the section called uh, From the Hands of Babes uh, on page 173. You might presume that a a two-and-a-half-year-old girl couldn't have much to say. If I were struck on the head and reduced to infant-level intelligence for two-and-a-half years, I'm fairly sure I wouldn't have a flood of stories to recount, none at least that were not considerably degrading. But there my daughter was, talking up a storm, a little about the few things that have happened to her, but mostly about things that never have and never will. Princesses, dragons, Spongebob, stegosauruses. She's five now, and there's been no let-up. She's talking to me as I write this. I just gave her a piece of paper and crowns, and although she's just begun trying her hand at writing, cat, dug, sack, S-A-A-C for snake, flower for flower, She's been putting her thoughts and words to the page for a long time now by drawing. Children invent their own writing through pictures. And because of that, offer us the chance to better understand the invention of writing. Through the works of Rhoda Kellogg in the mid-20th century, we know that children worldwide draw very similar shapes and follow a similar developmental schedule. Since they almost certainly have not evolved to draw, these similarities are, in a sense, parallel discoveries about how to effectively communicate on paper, on how to write. Sir Herbert E. Reed, an early 20th century professor of literature and arts, encountered Rhoda Kellogg's work late in his life and wrote the following. It has been shown by several investigators, but most effectively by Mrs. Rhoda Kellogg of San Francisco, that the expressive gestures of the infant from the moment that they can be recorded by crayon or pencil, evolve from certain basic scribbles towards consistent symbols. Symbols, that's key. Over over several years of development, such basic patterns gradually become the conscious representation of objects perceived. The substitute of sign becomes a visual image. According to this hypothesis, every child, in its discovery of a mode of symbolization, follows the same graphic evolution. I merely want you to to observe that it is universal and is found not only in the scribblings of children, but everywhere the making of signs has had a symbolizing purpose, which is from the Neolithic age onwards. But, back to me writing now, but aren't children's drawings just that? Drawings? It's certainly true that sometimes children are just trying to depict what they see. Those are mere drawings. But Often their drawings are aimed at saying something, at telling a story. When my daughter brings me her latest drawing, she usually doesn't brag about how real it looks, nor does she tell me about its composition and balance. Sure, sometimes she asks me to count how many legs her spider has, but usually I get a story, a long story. For example, here's a Cliff's Notes version of the story behind her drawing in Figure 1. In it is a house with arms and eyes. The windows have faces. It is a magic house. There is a girl holding a plate of cream puffs. Two people are playing with toys at the table, but a tomato exploded all over the toy. There are butterflies in the house. The drawing is intended to communicate a story, and that sounds an awful lot like writing. But if my daughter were truly writing, then she'd have 
to be using symbols. Is it really plausible that small children are putting symbols on the page before they learn formal writing, as Rhoda Kellogg and Herbert Reed believe? I think so. Consider, the most, consider that most children's drawings bear only the vaguest resemblance to the objects they are intended to depict. Look at nearly any of the objects in my daughter's drawings in Figure 1. An attempt at realism? Hardly. And we find similar kinds of symbols and cartoons drawn by adults. Adults who could draw realistically if they wished. These cartoon symbols, like those in the first row of Figure 2a, are ridiculously poor renderings of objects. There are similar visual signs in every culture, and although you'll probably have no trouble figuring out what animals the drawings are intended to symbolize, your dog would have no idea what they, or my daughter's drawings, are supposed to be. Symbols get their meaning through convention more than through resemblance. We're so used to these conventions that we are under the illusion that they actually look like the animals they refer to. But other cultures often have somewhat different conventions for their animals. For example, I find it difficult to tell what kind of animal I'm looking at in many of today's Japanese children's cartoons. You can see a few examples in the second row of Figure 2a. The same is true for sound. We in the United States say ribbit to imitate a frog's call. And after growing up thinking of that as the sound frogs make, it can be hard to appreciate that frogs don't really sound at all like that. In fact, people from different cultures use different sounds to refer to frog calls and each person is initially convinced that their sound is the one that most resembles a frog's. Algerians say gar-gar, Chinese say guo-guo, the English say croak, the French say koa koa, Koreans say gagul gagul, Argentinians say burp, Turks say vrak vrak, and so on. The sound ribbit is a symbol for the call of the frog, not a real attempt to mimic it just like children's drawings are symbolic rather than actually resembling the real-world objects they depict. So, children's drawings are attempts to communicate stories using symbols. Well, that sure sounds like writing to me, at least the barest of beginnings. If these little whippersnappers are smart enough to spontaneously invent writing largely on their own, perhaps it wouldn't hurt to look into the kinds of symbols they choose for their writing. And the kinds of symbols children choose is so obvious that it's hard to notice. Children draw object-like symbols for the objects in their writings. Their drawings may not look much like the objects they stand for, but they look like objects. Not like fractal patterns or footprints or scribbles or textures. The same is true for the cartoons drawn by adults, as in Figure 2a. And we find the same so obvious it's hard to notice phenomenon and animal calls. Although there are lots of different sounds used for frog calls, they are all animal call-like. All those frog calls are sounds some kind of animal could have made. What does this mean for writing? And that chapter continues after that. Again, if you're interested in um, these sorts of topics, um, get a copy of my bestseller, The Vision Revolution. And that was your science moment.